I lived in Texas for the last seven years, too long, seven years in hell. Um, I would not recommend living there. Um, and I'm just going to wing it tonight. I'm not going to do a prepared speech. They get kind of dramatic and emotional. And this one will probably be emotional, but I don't know about dramatic. Um, but I want to keep it more low key. Whenever I talk to small groups, kids, or prisoners, and, and I'm not like putting you on the same like level as you know those other groups, but I try to keep it more low key and more interactive. So I'm just going to tell you kind of a brief overview about who I am and what I do, and then you know open it up to questions, comments, more of a discussion. Hopefully, we're all intelligent people here and can have a discussion rather than me lecturing you all the time. So I will start with the beginning. In the beginning there was charity. Um, I had what I guess was or what to me was a normal childhood up until the age of six. Um, I had two parents. We were wealthy. We lived in Atlanta Country Club. We you know, never wanted for anything. I remember my father drove a Rolls Royce Silver Shadow and I blame that car on my car obsession. And um, I remember our home life being normal. I don't remember any fighting. I don't remember drama. I don't remember separations. I just remember being a happy kid up until the age of six. And then when I was six, on March 11th, 1980, my mother woke me and my, I had a nanny, of course I had a nanny, you know, woke the nanny and I up, um, took me to school early, uh, my mother took me to school, and my mother never took me to school sent the babysitter to run some errands. And the next thing I know, uh, by the end of the day, I'm on a plane to North Carolina to go stay with my grandparents because my father had been murdered a couple of hours after we left the house. He had been shot four times at close range in the head, the back, the heart, and the chest. Chest is in the heart, I know, but you know what I mean. Um, at the time, all I knew was that my father was dead. I don't remember knowing why. I remember when my mom told me that my father was dead. And I looked at her and I said, well, at least it wasn't you. Because that's how much I loved my mother at that time. I couldn't come home. And <clears throat> I knew things, I mean, I knew something was not right. I knew that life was not right. But I didn't know what was going on. Um, came home. Life went back to supposedly normal. My mom continued to work all the time. I spent most of my time with her like I always had, or hanging out at her business. And then in third grade, I started a new school because my mother is a very upwardly mobile woman, and so I was always advancing to better and better private schools, the more money she made. And I started this new school in Atlanta called Woodward Academy. It was the, the school in Atlanta. And you know that first day of school <clears throat> where you, you, know, you have to find your place because where you sit that day determines like the absolute rest of your future? you know, who you sit with at that table. There was a group of girls sitting at a table, and they were obviously, you know, the girls. And I, you know, third grade, and I'm not that big now, so, you know, I was a tiny little thing. And believe it or not, I was ridiculously shy as a child. So this took a lot of courage for me to do this. I was nothing like I am now. Walk up to this table ask if I can sit down and this one little girl I still remember her uh, 
looks at me and says, you can't sit with us. Your mother murdered your father. I had never heard that before. I just knew that my dad was dead. So I went home. I asked my mom about it. And I will never forget the reaction I got either. It was cold. It was unemotional. It was, that's none of your business. We will not discuss this. I will never discuss this. I don't have to tell you about any of that. It's my life. And that's pretty much what I got for most of my life. She didn't talk about my father. She didn't tell me anything good about my father. I heard the most awful things about my father. So this is what happened. My parents were not leading the normal life. My father was a chop shop guy and a drug trafficker and our company, our trucking company was used as a front for those businesses and my mother was the brains and she made it all legit. Well evidently my father decided to start doing his drugs, was getting a little out of control, my mother didn't like it and so to eliminate a threat to her future financial security, she had my father eliminated. She was arrested at the time. This is where she was when I was staying with my grandparents and didn't know why I couldn't go home. She had been arrested. She had been charged with murder one. Uh, allegedly, she hired a hitman, one of our drivers, to kill my father. She was tried and she was acquitted. So I never, I didn't have a parent in jail, but I had one that had been murdered and I had one that all these people that hated my mother but she wanted so hard to fit with because they all had money, hated her for supposedly killing him. So I might as well have had a parent in jail because I got the same thing. Every time, little girls, oh my God, little girls are mean. This whole sugar and spice and everything nice, who made that up? Because I remember these little girls, every single time they got mad at me, that's what they would use to hurt me. Well, your father murdered your, your, your mother murdered your father. Oh, Charity's getting mad. You better be careful. She might kill you. Like it was my fault. Like I had done it. I was just as clueless. Childhood was not pleasant. Now, I will be the first one to tell you. I was never beaten. I was never sexually abused. I was never even spanked. My mother tried to spank me one time, and I said, please, woman. You honestly think I'm going to let you hit me? I was always a little much to deal with. Um, I mean, I didn't have a terrible traumatic childhood in that regard. You know, a, a lot of people looking back on my childhood were like, oh, you had everything. I went to Europe for the first time when I was 12. I went to finishing school, believe it or not. Can't you tell? Um, I mean, you know, this was my mother was trying to well, now that I look back on it, I think she was trying to buy her, her, her respect. Because I think everybody knew that my mother had gotten away with murder, except me. My teenage years, you're an adolescent, you want to know who your dad is. And when you're told constantly that your dad is just this horrible person that was gunned down, you start to think as a kid that maybe you're half horrible. And then I have this horrible mother and I never felt like her. So I was stuck in this situation where I knew I wasn't like her but I didn't know what the difference was. 
And I knew that my mom didn't like me, but I didn't know why, because I loved her so much. Now that I'm an adult, I'm pretty sure that my mom didn't like me because if you see a picture of my daddy, every time I told her not to hit me, she heard my dad sassy in your face, toned biceps, all my dad. She hated me because I was the living embodiment of what she killed and I was in her face all the time. But as a child, you don't understand this. As a child, I grew up thinking that I was just horrible. So I did everything I could to make her love me, or even better, approve of me, because nothing got her approval. I did it all. I skipped the 10th grade. I graduated from high school when I was 16 varsity soccer when I was only supposed to be on JV and the whole time I did that in high school I shot heroin anything to get my mother's attention none of it worked she did everything she could my entire life to keep me as far away from her emotionally as possible and I suffered for it greatly as I said I was a heroin addict by the time I was 16. I had a pregnancy at 15, you know? So on the one hand, you know, when they're talking about the aces the other day, you know, it's possible to see a kid and they are stellar. On the outside, you see a straight A student with everything going for him, but you don't know until you take the time to sit down and talk to that kid what's really going on, because I did it all. And I really, the older I got, the more questions I had about my mom. <laughs> because the older I got, the colder my mom got. She always used to like to tell people that I was the perfect child until I was 12, and then I made her life hell. I almost died. I was 18. I weighed 80 pounds. And I begged my mother to take me to treatment. And she wouldn't. She told me it was a phase that I was going through. She didn't want to be embarrassed by me. So I told her if she didn't help me, that she would just be as, just as responsible for taking me out of the world as she was for bringing me into it because I was asking for help. So my mom missed 1%, found a state-run treatment facility three states away so nobody would know who we were. It was for adults. I was a juvenile. She told them, don't give her anything. Let her do this cold turkey. She's weak anyway. Let her hurt. If she leaves, don't call me. Call the cops. I don't care anymore. I was 18. She gave me a hundred bucks. Told me do as well as prescribe yourself for treatment. Overdose. I don't care anymore, Charity. You make my life too difficult. So I got away from her for a little while. Went to treatment. Got into college, University of Tennessee. Hope I never see the color orange again as long as I live. 90-year-old women in old cheerleading outfits are not cool, and they're very popular in the South. And then about a semester through college, I had been sober for a little over a year. I was absolutely miserable, miserable. Everybody kept telling you, if you get sober, it's going to be so much better. I'm like, when? When? Because it's not. So I had made up my mind that if I was not, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 19 at this time, or a little over 18, 19, I was 19. You know, we're kind of dramatic then. And I'm like, if I am not happy, happy in three months, that's it, I'm killing myself. I will, I never spent that 100 bucks on my mom. I wasn't gonna use it to get treatment. I was like, screw her, it was kind of a principal thing. 
So I pulled that hundred bucks out and I was like, well, I'll use it for what she intended. Three months. I even circled it on the calendar. Two weeks later, I woke up one day and I felt funny. Just like, I don't know why. I just felt funny. I called a friend of mine and I said, hey, you know what? I said, this is going to sound really crazy. I said, but I think I'm pregnant. He's like, you're insane. I'm like, no. He's like, are you on? I'm like, yes, yeah, I'm safe. Da, da, da. Have you missed your period? No. Well, Char Charity, you're crazy. I'm like, no, I'm telling you, I got a feeling about this. He's like, well, let's just, so we go to the store, get a test. Sure enough, Charity's pregnant. It changed everything. I found out that day, or what I found out that day, it took all thoughts of hurting myself out of my head. As soon as I knew I was pregnant, immediate fierce, fierce love that I never knew existed because nobody had ever shown it to me. I was determined to do whatever it took to have my child, and I did. My mother did not make it easy, trust me. The first thing she said was have an abortion. The first thing I said is if you ever say that word to me again, I will never speak to you as long as you live. I wasn't asking permission. I was calling to tell you you're going to be a grandmother. Congrats. Paris, my son, was born on October 10th, 1993. And I will never forget the first time I saw Paris. He saved my life. He taught me everything that I know about love. All the battles with my mother over who was in control became worth it because I wasn't fighting for myself anymore. I was fighting to keep this child safe from her. I didn't know how to be a good mother, but I sure as hell knew how to be a bad one. So I was going to do everything the opposite of what my mother would have done. And somewhere along the way, I actually turned into a good mother, in spite of the fact I had no good teachers. Life was normal for the most part. Again, the majority of the drama in my life was caused by the fact that my mom seems to have this proclivity for multiple marriages to the same people who like to beat her. All the drama was always her. She'd been beat up. This, she was getting divorced. She was getting married. I was always trying, I mean, you know, the only thing I wanted my whole life, and you know, maybe some of you can relate to this if you have crazy families, is like, I just wanna be normal, people. Like for one day, I would just like to be normal. And it never seemed possible because my mom, but yet everything was somehow always my fault. So it was stressful, but life at home, our home, was good. We had a much different kind of family dynamic than what went on in my mom's house. Uh, Paris was not around his father. People always ask. Paris was not around his father, and it's probably best that he was not, because two years after Paris's father left, he was found wandering the streets somewhere and had he you know we were both young and he was right around that age where schizophrenia can kick in and two years after Paris was born he was in full blown full blown paranoid schizophrenia he's always been an amazing man he's always paid child support boy can be psychotic and telling you about angels on meat hooks and hands you a child support check it's really fascinating it's just like and it's just but, you know, he was, he was not our problem, is my point. Yes, he wasn't there, but it's not always best that they're there. I remarried when Paris was, or not remarried, I got married. I wasn't married to Paris's dad. I got married when Paris was seven. I <laughs> have absolutely the worst luck in the world dated this man for two years 
you know, I wasn't drinking or any of those things at the time because, you know, I the heroin and everything come a long way. Um, but, you know, so Jonathan, he, he didn't drink or anything, and you're just like, well, cool, no biggie. We get married two weeks later, he disappears, and I'm like, where's my husband? A couple days goes by, no husband, you know. Long story short, turns out Jonathan was a binge alcoholic, and nobody bothered to fill me in. So he got worse. I got pregnant. Uh not really planning on it. I mean, wanting to, but not planning on it to happen that quickly. You know, like within a month, it was like, wham. I'm like, whoa. Found out that I was, you know, falling in love again. And this time, I had a little girl. Unfortunately, her father did not get any better so I separated and was divorced by the time my daughter was born because I wasn't going to put my children through that and had Ella and Ella was you know I'd like to say that everything she was everything that Paris was not but that's not really true they were just you know, where Paris was quiet and affectionate, Ella was all over you and affectionate. Whereas, you know, Paris was, you know, super intelligent, but, you know, was happy just telling you about it. Ella had to tell everybody how smart she was. You know, they were, they were the perfect complement. And Paris, Paris wasn't happy when I was pregnant. I mean, he wasn't, you know, like these bad seed kids you see movies about, but he wasn't happy. It was just, you know, Paris, do you want to feel the baby kick? No. You know, it's like, so as a parent, you're thinking a little jealousy, he'll come around. And, and, and there was nothing that made me think this is some sort of pathological problem. The day that Ella was born, I had her at home with a midwife, Paris was home from school, and um, she was born at 9.16 in the morning. And I remember the midwife going to get Paris, <coughs> and I was a little worried because I knew that he had been jealous. He didn't, you know. She brought him in, and I said, Paris, do you want to meet your new little sister? And he said, well, sure. So I said, okay, you know, hold your arms like this. So I put, he did his arms, and I handed Ella to him. And I don't care what anybody says about my son now. I know when he looked at Ella, he fell in love because I saw it on his face. I saw him take his sister and look at her and look at me just like, like he fell in love. He was the most amazing big brother. He was eight when she was born, and for four and a half years, he was incredible until the night he murdered her, which was February 4th, 2007. I had no idea, none. People ask me all the time, did you see any signs? No, no. If I had seen the signs, Ella would be alive. When the cops walked in the door to tell me that Ella had been murdered, Peyton was on the big screen behind me giving his post-game interview. You just won the Super Bowl. What happened to you, Charity? Your son just murdered your daughter. 
it seemed so surreal that this person and I had this connection. And here we were. So I had a babysitter. Paris talked her into going home. He broke through my security protected laptop, spent about an hour looking at sadistic pornography on the internet, which I found out later he had been doing since he was nine years old. Went into my bedroom, laid down next to his sister, began to touch her inappropriately. He took the knife in the bedroom with him. He says that his intention was not to stab her, but we know it is. He took the knife with him. He began by beating Ella. He told me later that he wanted her awake because he wanted her to know who was hurting her. He tried to choke her to death. He told me later that he did not realize that choking somebody to death took that long. So he stabbed her 17 times to put her out of her misery, as he says. In the five and a half years since Paris killed his sister, I now believe, and, and it's not just a, it's not just, you know, a, a feeling, it's a, it's a belief grounded and backed up by thousands of dollars of lawyers and psychologists that I've hired to fight my way in there to get my son tested because the state of Texas keeps telling me that my son is a product of his environment. You know, hey, it's got to be the mom, right? Um, but we now know, and the authorities have finally agreed, that my son well, I guess the easiest way to put it is what the doctor, or the last doctor I hired told me before he told me to stop hiring people and to change my name and disappear, which is, Charity, your son has every characteristic needed to be the next Ted Bundy if he's not stopped. He has no capacity for empathy, no capacity for guilt, very limited ability for compassion. I asked him one time why he killed his sister. He told me that he'd always wanted to know what it was like to kill somebody. I said, Jesus Christ, Paris, we had four cats. Why didn't you kill a cat? Mama, are you crazy? I love my cat. That's how my son thinks. He does not possess the same feelings that we do. So I can't really be mad at him anymore because he is who he is. Just like I am who I am, this overly empathetic, bleeding heart individual, my son seems to be the opposite. A month after Paris was arrested, the juvenile authorities in Texas were put under federal indictment for the physical sexual abuse of children in their care. In addition to the fact that they weren't meeting federal jail standards, they weren't meeting federal education standards, there was teenage girls and boys who were being raped by guards. Two of them have been brought up on charges. They were given a five-year suspended sentence for raping boys they were supposed to be helping. Anyway, the local paper, trying to sell as many papers as possible, ran this story about kids who kill and why they do it. And of course, it's because they come from violent households with crazy mothers. 
And then right next to it, you know, was this big article about the fact that this place that I knew my son was going to, that little boys were getting raped there. And if I had not read that article, I probably would be dead now because I'm pretty sure I could not have kept up the emotional pressure that I live under if I hadn't gotten angry at something other than my son because I was determined from the beginning not to take my anger out on my child. He was a kid and he was sick and I am his mother. I'm supposed to help him when he hurts, not hurt him when he hurts. So that gave me a perfect outlet for my anger. I started raising hell with the juvenile authorities in Texas. And they were worried because they realized, I think, maybe I'm just tooting my own horn, but I think they realized that they were dealing with a mother who was not going away, could not be easily intimidated like the authorities so often do to families of the incarcerated to get them to shut up about all the horrible things they see in prisons, that I was smart, smarter than a lot of them, that I had some money and that I would be out there running my mouth to anybody that listened if they didn't work with me. So I kind of put a lot of pressure on them. And at first, I'll admit, it was all about my son. I had absolutely no concern or care. All I knew is that if anybody laid a hand on my baby, there was going to be hell to pay. But when you have a loved one in prison, you spend a lot of time at that prison if you go to see them. And it takes a long time to get processed through, to go through the checks, to, you know, and, and you start to see the same people over and over because there's some families that, you know, that were like me. They're always there come hell or high water, you know, and then you start to see that there's other kids that have nobody. You get to talking to everybody. You start to, you know, to meet them. And it dawned on me that as bad as I had it, a lot of these people had it worse. You know, maybe not in terms of the nature of their crime or their level of victimization or trauma, but they really had it worse because they weren't in a position to be able to do anything to help themselves. They had to work three jobs just to have enough gas money to come see their kids. Texas is huge. It takes a day to drive across it if you are on the wrong side, you know? So, I started fighting for them too because they were kids and these were their families. And somewhere, and I'm still not even really sure how, the Yellow Foundation came out of this five years, well, five years later. We were only officially started last year. Uh, in fact, I think August is our anniversary. I should celebrate at some point. Um, but, you know, I've been doing the work since a month after my son was born. And in the five years since I started working, these are now the issues that the Ella Foundation deals with on a regular basis. Children of the incarcerated, the incarcerated, those on death row, families of those on death row, the wrongfully accused, the innocent, the exonerated, uh, sex offender issues, uh, you name it, it has something to do with criminal justice, I'll deal with it. One of the things that makes what I do unique is I work with victims too, not just offenders. In fact, I don't even like those words 